get this. You know the whole thing about Joseph Smith using his hat while he's translating? This is nuts, man. More of what I found that like exploded my head. So this is a really solid refutation of the idea that Joseph Smith just lifted the temple ritual from Freemasonry. Right. This is the idea of theosis, human deification. All the dots connected all at once. So critics will talk about, or skeptics or whatever, will talk about... The, I just call them losers. The, well, it does seem that everybody scripturally that ever talked about entering the presence of God had to experience a deep transformation. I won't believe it until I read it in the book of Zebulok. And uh, time and space are obliterated. He can see anything. And he says he had acquired one of the attributes of deity and all seeing eye. Welcome back to Ward Radio, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Cardinal. I'm joined in the studio by Don Bradley, as well as Brad Whitbeck and Sean Bailey. And uh, our, our, we veered verbose, Don, and you gave such a lovely story of you coming back to church. Um, we never actually answered my question. We're doing makeup here. You know what I'm saying? Sir. You never answered my question as to, in your study and all of your research for the lost 116 pages, your book, you can now once again show the cover. You know, we got to publicize the book, baby. All right. In your uh, research for the lost 116 pages, um, I wanted to know, was there any kind of story that you found um, or any kind of new information that you gleaned while doing your research that just really debunked kind of an anti-Mormon claim that had made you veer off the chosen path like a filthy godless pagan. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but is there, was there anything that had, you know, that kind of you you realized you, you debunked a major myth? Yeah, totally. I mean, so one thing that I mentioned earlier, of course, would be the, Lu the story that Lucy Harris took the manuscript and burned it, right? But okay, yeah, yeah. When yeah. we're talking about like piecing together what was in the lost pages from the sources that we have, uh, the coolest story that was in the Lost Pages from what we've discovered so far is the story of King Mosiah the First finding the interpreters, the Jaredite Urim and Thummim. Rock and on. that okay. story... So part, Mosiah the First is Benjamin's dad, right? Right, right, okay. right, right. So, so you've got... And just like Inception talked about dreams within a dream, uh, like in Mosiah, they the book that's translated through an interpreter, it talks about Mosiah having found an interpreter in plates of a previous civilization. So it's kind of like uh, an interpreter with an interpreted thing, right? Yeah, they, there is like a kind of nested story, yeah, like the okay. Ru Russian dolls or like Inception, like you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. Interpreterception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So yeah. the part of what's cool about that story, it's just a cool story on so many levels. But part of what's cool about it is the temple connections. So we the the Nauvoo Temple endowment, uh, like what where does that originate, right? So I had thought that it doesn't originate until 1842 when Joseph Smith becomes a Freemason, that this is his first glimpse of what is going to be the endowment. That's not in my research on the lost pages, which by the way, I did over a period of about 15 years. Um, and then, you know, wrote the book. Yeah. But, okay. um, that story really changed a lot of how I saw the restoration. So as I as we talked about before, I was out of the church. Well, I was a not non-believer at the time that I started that project. And I was out of the church during much of the time that I was doing my research. And so uh, one of the questions that comes up in the Book of Mormon text that we have is how did the Jaredites get I mean, so how did the Nephites get the Jaredite interpreters? Mm -hmm. So the, the Book of Mormon's Urim and Thummim, right? Yeah. Uh, that came with the plates. So if you look in the story of the brother Jared in the Book of Ether, in Ether chapter 3, it tells how the Jaredites got the interpreters, right? Mm -hmm. in, e in what? Ether chapter 3? Ether 3. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yep. And so um, I... I was doing a research project as part of my graduate work on, it was actually on the first vision uh, as Joseph Smith's initiation as a seer. And then I was also simultaneously doing work on the lost pages of the Book of Mormon 
And I noticed something while I was working on this. I noticed that in the story of the brother of Jared becoming a seer, when he gets the interpreters, that it was loaded with connections to the endowment. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you've got um, Joseph Smith says that in Nauvoo, that anciently mountaintops could serve as temples, that when the people were not able to build a temple, they could just go up on a mountaintop and God would give them the temple ordinances there. Oh, right. that's so, kind of like the mountaintop of Shem when the brother of Jared took the six heavy stones yeah, up to the right, top of yeah. the mountain. Yeah. Or that was called Shelem. Right, Sorry, exactly. I take that back. Okay. Right, Mount Shelem, right, exactly. And so, Nephi and Moses and, yeah. right? Right, lots, lots of instances of this, right? So when we see the brother of Jared going up on a mountaintop, we should think temple context, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so you've got this narrative where they're on top of the mountain, and um, the Lord, um, he speaks with the Lord through the veil. That's what he says. He calls it the veil, right? Um, and during that narrative, the Lord puts his hand forth through the veil, and the brother of Jared sees his hand, and the Lord asks him a series of questions to test his faith and knowledge, beginning with a question about his hand. And then once he has passed this test, and so I'm I'm not obviously making direct comparisons here to things that happen in the temple, but anyone who's gone through the temple will be able to see the parallels, right? Yeah. So um, once he has passed the test, right, with giving the correct answers to these questions, the Lord admits him into his presence, and he tells him, you are redeemed from the fall. The fall, well, that's the whole story of Adam and Eve, right? So that story is being brought up here, the story of Adam and Eve. It's like the brother of Jared is living out the end of that story, right? Well, we've all suffered from the fall, but then he's being redeemed from the fall, returning to the Lord's presence. And um, the Lord gives him, he touches the stones that the brother of Jared has brought him, right? Um, So that the people can see in the darkness on their journey. And then he gives them two additional stones, and these are the interpreters. And these are white stones that the brother of Jared receives, and in jo- Joseph Smith said, and it's in the book of Revelation, to him that overcometh, I will give unto him a white stone in the which is written a new name, which no man knoweth save him that receiveth it. Right. So connected right. with this whole story of what's happening in this dialogue at the veil, he receives this stone that's connected with the idea of receiving a new, na- new name that no one else knows. And then um, he is... Well, the guy that this is happening to, we just know him as the brother of Jared because in the text it does not give his name. So there's a theme right there of like secret names, Mm. right? Esoteric names, names that you can't share. And so um, then uh, the brother of Jared is given a revelation of things that are so sacred that he can't share them with other people. So this this becomes the lost pages of the Book of Mormon, right? I'm mean, yeah, sorry, the, the, the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, yeah. At, the e- at the end of this experience, something is sealed, right? Right, exactly. And part of what is sealed is what he learns from the Lord. Right, 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 right. So all these elements, right, would be familiar to Latter-day Saints. Yeah, they're very and parallel. And then um, Lucy Max Smith actually uh, gave us a description of what those interpreters looked like. Oh, yeah? Right. Um, cool. So... She was actually the person who, she's the only person that we know of that Joseph just like hands the interpreters to, right? Mm, He actually lets her see them and handle them. And she says that they were triangular. She says that they were three-cornered diamonds, what she calls them. Interesting. Mm. So it turns out her husband in an interview with is that uh, what these pictures are that you threw up in the discord mm-hmm, do i do i mm-hmm. put them up right now um hold on just a sec on those oh. yeah. um so uh her husband talks about how uh, joseph senior said that on the top plate of the <laughs> on the top plate of the golden plates is where the interpreters were placed but on that plate there were also engravings and he said the engravings included the implements of Freemasonry. So if you think about hmm. what are the main symbols of Freemasonry, these are well known. It's the compass and the square. Yeah. Right? These right. Are the I watched National Treasure. Most prominent. Right, yeah. Exactly. Uh-huh. Right. right? Yeah. And so on every Masonic lodge, 
Uh, in, in every Masonic lodge, on the altar of that lodge is a sacred book, usually the Bible. And on top of it, they put the compass and square. And so fascinatingly, Joseph Smith Sr. is describing that on the gold plates, you've got the sacred symbols of the compass and the square. Yeah. Right? Which, by the way, these are ancient symbols. Um, another uh, image people can find by like, Googling would be there's this ancient Chinese image of a man and a woman who are in, supposed to have been involved in the creation of the world holding a compass and square. This image is like three or 4,000 years old. This is in these China, are, you said? These are... Mm -hmm. So these are not, compass and square are not just like modern Masonic symbols. They are ancient symbols. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Like, you're right. Is it this wide. one that yeah. I see right that's, here? That's it. Yeah, share that one, Carl. Oh, I am totally uh, open image in new tab. Okay, wow. Look at that right there. You're right. right. So because in the ancient world, these are tools, the compass and square were tools that they used for like, um, creating plans for buildings and then actually building things, right? Making sure that things were level and square and measuring angles and so on. That's what they used the square and the compass for. Yeah. So these are ancient symbols and they are, according to Justice Senior's account, these are on the top plate, the golden plates, and set over them are these two triangular shaped uh, interpreters. So if you think about like you've got the compass and square shape and then you've got the interpreters on top of those, well, one, um, so now the, the other image coming up here, Cardin. Um, oh, okay. So um, what would make sense, you, you have multiple different, not that one, the other one. Um, okay. You have different kinds of, oh, sorry, no, I'm totally wrong, that one. <laughs> it is that one. Oh, it is sorry. this one. Yeah, okay, there we go. So you have different kinds of triangles, obviously, right? The most two most basic are you've got an equilateral triangle, right, with equal angles, and then you've got a right triangle. Right. And those actually correspond to compass and square. Com a compass is usually shown as being open to 60 degrees, so that corresponds to an equilateral triangle. You just add another line to the compass, and you've got an equilateral triangle. Um, with the square, you add another line, um, and then is that the hypotenuse or whatever? You add another line, and you get a right triangle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, based on um, Lucy's account added to just her husband, Joseph Smith Sr.'s account, you come up with the idea that those interpreters are going to be in the shapes of compass and square, so they're going to be an equilateral triangle and a right triangle. Okay, so are you saying that those two, the, the, the Urim and Thummim were in the shape of those triangles, and that they were sit like embedded in the front cover of the gold plates. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dude. Right. And and so um, the picture that we're looking at here um, with the two different triangles. Are you saying that one of those should be more like a longer triangle, or are those like a compass? Because um, it looks like the picture that you made. They're actually both square. Well, okay. So I didn't. I didn't make this. This is a friend who did this. So the. The triangle on the left should be, I mean, they should be more regular in shape. Yeah. The okay. triangle on the left should be more equilateral there. Okay. Okay. Um, he had, he had actually made this image before I consulted with him. He's an artist, Jody Livingston. Oh, um, fascinating. And so I just asked if I could use it, even though it's not quite exact. But, yeah. Um, so um, if the brother of Jared is having this dialogue with the Lord through the veil, right? The Lord puts his hand through the veil. There's this testing that happens. He's admitted into the Lord's presence, redeemed from the fall of Adam and Eve. He's given these white stones that reflect the idea of a new name and his own name is being withheld from us. And these interpreters that he's being given are in the shape of compass and square. That just has all sorts of mind-blowing resonances for Latter-day Saints, yeah. right, with regard to the temple. For real. Well, um, and if, if you put, do you think that those two things were together? Like, were they one on top of another? Sort of like a Star of David or something? So, uh, Cardin, that's the next image. So that's... Okay. Because the um, mm -hmm. Star of David is basically two triangles, It right? is. Yeah. And so this, oh, there you go. this, again, would not necessarily be exact because he's the artist here is showing uh, two triangles that appear to be basically the same, whereas they'd actually be a little bit a little different. Bit so there would be an asymmetry there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this is... So when the brother of Jared is given the interpreters, right... Yeah. Yeah. He's told to take the plates that he makes and seal them, and then to take the interpreters and seal them uh, up with those plates, right? So 
anciently, we have different ideas of what it means to seal. Obviously, you like seal marriages. You seal an anointing. Um, we have the seals. Sealing, the sealing by the Holy Ghost. The right. sealing by the Holy there, Spirit. There are promise. seals that are placed on ancient documents. Well, one type of seal is the Star of David is actually also known as the Seal of Solomon. Right? Oh, so yeah. certain sacred symbols could be used as seals. So it may be that part of what it meant to have to seal up the plates would be to add a, a sacred symbol that represents like the sealing, uh, spiritual sealing of these plates oh, into God's wow. care. And so when if he is pl- sealing up the interpreters, he's yeah. actually putting them in the shape of this seal on top of where those same figures are on yeah. the engravings on the top plate. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Okay, so you you have a square and a compass. Yeah, so I'm just drawing out. So it should look more like this, right? Is what you're saying? I, I can't. I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can see it. So it should be more like an equilateral right. mm-hmm. triangle okay. than with a square triangle that has the A squared plus B squared plus C squared longer hypotenuse is what the artist rendition should have been instead of having yeah. two, two sort of right triangles. Right? Two right triangles. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. That makes sense. All right. Mm-hmm. Wow. But either way, both are going to generally give an image that looks similar to that when they're put together. Right. So, okay. Right. Wow. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So you're saying that you have the square and the compass, but you added lines to the square and the compass. Mm -hmm. So you have two other symbols too, right? You have two additional lines. Uh, Yeah. Okay, okay. Which which we won't go into, but people might piece them together, literally. Um, (laughs) Well, um, the ruler ruler is like a symbol of, uh, one of the symbols of masonry too, right? Freemasonry. Is like a ruler with the square and a compass. Those are the three tools or whatever. Isn't that is that right? I'm not sure. Maybe okay, I'm, not I might sure. be making Maybe. that up. I don't know. Oh, actually, I think it is used as a symbol. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, adding the ruler to the square and the compass. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, keep going. Okay. So when I started to see this, I was pretty wowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? you could for say. sure. So I started seeing other things. So I was mentioned. So this is sort of a prelude to the coolest story in the Lost Pages. What we can know of the Lost Pages. So scholars on the subject of the interpreter, scholars of the Book of Mormon, have noticed for decades that the Book of Mormon seems to be missing an important story. So it tells us in detail how the Jaredites got the interpreters. Mm-hmm. What about the Nephites? The Nephites yeah, have these interpreters. Then Joseph Smith is getting them from the Nephites, right? right Moroni has Moroni. buried them, mm-hmm, right? right? So how did they get them? Well, not only did Moroni have them, but we know that hundreds of years before him, Mosiah II used them to translate a Jaredite record. It says that explicitly. Mm-hmm. So we know he had them. The 24 Jaredite right. plates. His yeah. father, Benjamin, Actually, in the old in the re, in the earliest manuscripts of the Book of Mormon, it actually says his father Benjamin had them. It says it in two different places, but later editors thought that was a mistake and actually changed it to Mosiah the Second. Okay, hmm. but because it says it twice in two unrelated parts of the Book of Mormon, I'm going to believe that Benjamin had them. Okay, yeah, why would he not? Right, why would he right. not? So, but the Book of Mormon text that we have never describes Benjamin getting them. Uh. So. Either he got them, but but the after the lost pages were lost or stolen, um, Joseph picks up translating from that point, right, which is about 450 years into Nephite history with the reign of King Benjamin. Uh, uh, then it goes from there till you know Benjamin's death all the way through Moroni, and then he goes back and he translates the small plates to replaced replace the lost portion, right? So the early part of King Benjamin's story, the mm-hmm. original full story, was lost with the lost pages. Oh. So Benjamin might have gotten the interpreters when he was younger, but if he did, that would have been in the lost pages. Well, actually, he probably gets them from his dad as well, because okay. his dad was Mosiah yeah. the first. It says in the small plates in um, Omni mm-hmm. that a Jaredite record written on a a large stone was brought to Mosiah the first and that he interpreted the engravings that were on them. Well, how do you interpret them? Well, that's what the interpreters were for. Right. So presumably that's what he used. So he probably had them, right? So his story 
his full story was in the lost pages. We only get a thumbnail sketch of it in the small plates. Okay. Well, do you think that um, the interpreters were with that stone? Is that where they came from? Um, no. But I'll okay. but I'll talk about the story uh, of where they come from. Right, where okay. they come from. Okay. Cool. So so people brought the stone to him for him to interpret them. So presumably they already thought he had the ability okay. to do cool. that. Um, so um, we've got scholars saying, oh, the story of how the Nephites got the interpreter should be in the Book of Mormon, but it's not. Maybe it was in the Lost Pages. Right. So people right. before I started my research for this book, someone had already a couple of scholars had already suggested that. So um, I was looking in one of our best sources, one of our most fascinating sources about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and what was in the Lost Pages. It's an interview that Fayette Laffam, who was a cousin of Martin Harris's mother, uh, did with Joseph Smith Sr. in 1830. Fayette Laffam is a young man, businessman in Palmyra. Uh, he's hearing the buzz about this Book of Mormon thing that's going to be coming forth, right? We're going to be uh, for sale soon, but it's not for sale yet. It's still being printed. And he does what I think I would have done. He goes to the Smith home and he knocks on the door and he, he asks questions. He wants to know. You know? Yeah, because they're still alive, right? right? Just go they talk to around. them. Ask yeah. them the questions. They were there. You know, they're in, they live in the same couple towns there, right? So um, so Joseph Sr. gives him, an ex him and uh, another friend an extensive interview and he talks about the coming forth of the Lost Pages, and then he talks, I mean, of the Book of Mormon, and then he talks about the stories that were in the Book of Mormon. And when he's talking about the stories in the Book of Mormon, um, he tells some familiar stories, sometimes familiar stories with added details, like we talked about before, about like the Passover, how you know Laban was slain during the Passover, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, he tells some narratives that are not in our Book of Mormon text, but they would fit like hand and glove. They, they're, they're perfect, right? So one of the stories that he tells is, he says, after they are living in the New World, they do a kind of um, exodus, right? They're traveling, and they're being led by the Liahona, right? So, so the guy who possesses the Liahona, it's leading him along, and uh, it leads him to an object but he doesn't know, he knows God is leading him to this object, but he doesn't know why, he doesn't know what it's for. And so he carries the object into their tabernacle. So because they're on a kind of excess, they don't have a temple at this point. Mm, okay. And this is actually why I think it's, this guy is actually Mosiah the First. Fayette Leffen doesn't remember the name. But Mosiah the First led the people's exodus from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla. Yeah. Right. So uh, he... This guy, um, he takes this object that he's been led to, he takes it into the tabernacle, and immediately the voice of the Lord asks him, what is that in your hand? And he answered that he did not know, but had come to inquire. And then the mm. Lord told him, take it and put it on your face, cover your face with an animal skin, and he does, and he can see anything. It's wow. the interpreters. Yeah. Right? Wait, so, where is this again? This is in an interview. That interview. Right. And an animal skin would be symbolic of like the veil, right? Right. And because oh, of yeah. the way that the tabernacle worked in the, the Old The tabernacle Testament. was covered with animal skins. Yeah. When the sacred relics of the tabernacle were being transported, mm -hmm. they were wrapped in badger skins. Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting, right? Because get this. <laughs> you know the whole thing about Joseph Smith using his hat? While he's translating? Sure. Yeah. Oh. Was his hat made out of badger skin? Beaver skin. Oh. The American hey. badger. Wow. I, I looked to see what the hat was made of after I was examining this account. Yeah. And wow. we have one statement that says it was a beaver skin hat. Oh, okay. fascinating. So Joseph is actually following the pattern that's in this narrative, mm -hmm. lost narrative from the Book of Mormon. He's oh. using the see, a seeing instrument and he's covering his face with an animal skin. And that is echoing when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and his face is shining because of the glory of God. He yeah, covers he his face. Yeah. The tabernacle was covered with animal skins, badger skins. The sacred relics when they're being transported are temple relics are being covered in badger skins. When Joseph himself has a sacred object, he's wrapping it in a similar thing, a beaver skin. 
So Whoa. why do you think they use badger, or beaver? Why why that particular animal? Any so I think that actually it's because certain animals have fur that's more water repellent, oh, okay. and so water animals tend to have fur that's good for good with water. So they're trying to protect the tabernacle by making the outer covering waterproof. Okay. essentially. Mm. cool. And then all of those accounts that talk about Joseph looking into the hat with the spectacles in the hat mm-hmm. makes sense totally. in that way. Yeah, totally. that's right. fascinating. So if you look at this narrative, even though it's not a narrative that's in, oh, I forgot one thing. Okay. After this, um, the guy here, like I said, I'm thinking Mosiah the first, who was led to these interpreters by the Liahona. Now the Liahona stops working for him. Okay, so well, now oh. he's only got the interpreters. So he goes to, he, the Liahona guides him to these interpreters. And when he finally finds them, the Liahona just stops? Right. Wow. And the, the Liahona, strangely, as uh, we've talked about earlier, it's actually, um, it's referred to as a compass. Yeah. Oh, and then the dude. interpreters that replace it are in the shapes of compass and square. So it's more complete. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So the Liahona is replaced by something that's more full. Yeah. Because right? the Liahona also had writing in it, right? Mm-hmm. That was kind of like, it was almost an, an interpreter of its own. Right. Because writing could appear on it, right? Mm-hmm. So even though this narrative is not in our Book of Mormon text, it answers questions that our Book of Mormon text raises but doesn't answer. Yeah. How did the Nephites get the interpreters? Why... When the we know that the Nephites still have the Liahona centuries later, why are they not using it? Yeah, in the why Bukama, aren't they It's being it? passed down, but it's not being used, right? Like in their wars with the Lamanites, they're not taking it out into the wilderness to help them know where to travel. This story would explain both of those unanswered questions. From and this the story came from who again? Joseph where? Smith Sr. Told to wow. Fiat Latham. And and it was in the lost 116 pages, or so. So that's what I argue is because he's telling this as a story that's from the Book of Mormon, and it would fit, but it's not in our Book of Mormon. Well, there's an easy explanation for that. There's a part of the Book of Mormon that they knew about that we don't have. That's missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so this is the inference is this is from the lost pages. So this story, so book, uh, the real narratives of the Book of Mormon, the Book of, Narrative Mormons, <laughs> book of Mormon narratives that we have, they often have ex- echoes of the biblical exodus, right? yeah. like we talked about before. Like, um, you know, Lehi is like a new Moses. He leads his people to right. the promised land, right? Yeah. Just like Moses. Across a body um, of water. <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. And that, so there are various parallels there. And all through the Book of Mormon, you have echoes of the exodus. Well, in this narrative, right, it's echoing what they were doing with the tabernacle, right, with the skins and mm-hmm. so on. They have a tabernacle, right? So they're traveling in the wilderness with a tabernacle. That's an exodus, yeah. right? Um, the guy who's presumably leading this exodus, Mosiah, Hugh Nibley suggested his name combines Moses and Josiah. So again, Moses, exodus. He's got, you know, he's veiling his face. That's like, like I mentioned earlier, Moses coming down from Sinai, right? And he's he veils his face. Oh, with um, two stones, by the way. Oh, then, yeah. <laughs> also yeah. right. tablets, stone right. tablets. He comes down, yeah. Right, he comes down with uh, touched yeah, by the, the finger of the, the Lord. pair of tablets, yeah. right? So the right? stones, yeah, right. yeah, right, exactly, right, right, stones that have been touched by the finger of God, precisely. Uh huh. Right? So this is. These these parallels are very clear, right? So, in fact, the story... So, so, when the Lord asks him, what is that in your hand? That question is from Exodus 4, verse 1. That's when they're up on... When Moses is up on Sinai at the burning bush, that's what the Lord asks him. What is that in your hand? And it's Moses' rod is what it's referring to. Yeah. So, this has... Just like the Book of Mormon narratives that we have, this has all kinds of echoes of the biblical exodus, right? Which mm-hmm. is another thing that helps show, yeah, this is legit. But then this crazy thing, right, for Latter-day Saints in the context of thinking about the temple, right? That, you know, he goes, he carries this object into the tabernacle, so into the temple. The voice of the Lord talks to him, presumably from behind the veil of the Holy of Holies, since that's where the Lord's presence was understood to be. Yeah. The voice of the Lord asks him, what is that in your hand? And he says, he did not know, but had come to inquire. 
So he didn't know what was in his hand. He was going to the Lord to ask the. He says, "Yeah, that's that's what I've come to ask you." Uh, yeah, right? yeah, that's what I want to know. And and so this is like the story of the brother of Jared on the mountaintop having a dialogue with the Lord that has all sorts of temple resonances. This, too. So, so the. The story of the Jaredites getting the interpreters is loaded with temple connections and dialogue yeah. connections. Then the story here of the Nephites getting the interpreters is again loaded with parallel temple connections. Yeah. And so this again, this was one of the things that was just like blowing my mind, right? That mm. yeah. you had all these temple connections. And like I also because the larger paper that I was doing on this had to do with the first vision. Hey. Mm. Um, I had looked at um, the first vision as Joseph Smith's initiation as a seer. And so I was thinking, well, it's his first vision. So it, since it's his first instance of second sight, this is how he becomes a seer, mm. right? And so I found an account of the first vision given by John Alger Alger, uh, brother to Fanny Alder or Alger, um, and he said that when he was living with Joseph Smith Sr.'s family, while Fanny was living with Joseph Jr.'s family in Kirtland in the 1830s, um, that one time Joseph Smith related the first vision, and he said that Joseph said that at the beginning of his experience, the Lord touched his eyes, and then he was able to see the vision. Right. Mm. And so, okay, well, so that's that's different than most of the first vision accounts that we ever hear, right? Where he's just kind of was on that the hidden in the vault with Joseph <laughs> F. Smith's secret copy that they refused to show us until internet activism revealed it. And 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 is that how it went? <laughs> no, <laughs> just in somebody's journal. Oh, okay. And, and cool, this cool. this one is interesting because it's somebody's journal who is like many of the accounts of the first vision are told to somebody who is like Joseph thinks the first guy he tells is Jewish. Mm -hmm. He has a different right. audience with the next group of people he tells. It's mm -hmm. a more general audience, but it's not members of the church. Mm -hmm. But this guy was a member of the church, right? Right. So, and, and it's not only that he's telling it here to other Latter-day Saints, he's telling it privately in his family's home yeah so which would be more intimate he would probably be he more would free reveal to more. share things yeah, yeah he would yeah. disclose more so he's disclosing the fact that his eyes were touched at the beginning of the vision well in the um in the biblical stories of jesus healing the blind there are instances where he touches the eyes of the blind and they're healed mm -hmm. right? they can see and so this is joseph smith's healing wow. from spiritual blindness Wow. Okay. Wow. So he, it echoes Isaiah too, with the coal put on his lips. Oh, yeah, the coal on his lips, mm -hmm. and and even Enoch with mm -hmm. the clay anointing his own eyes. Mm -hmm. well, so, so what is the and what even is the, Zebulok with the burning <laughs> stick <laughs> in his armpit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, you guys were all coming up with great examples. I, just, I, I had to That's jump a, right in. You deep, know, what I'm saying? apocryphal. You know, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Zebulon, you know, yeah. that was a good one. <laughs> so where does that fit in the narrative of the first vision? So like he's on the ground, like in the famous show or whatever, and he's, he's praying out and the Lord appears, light comes down. And one of the, does, does that happen immediately? Like the Lord just picks him up and touches his eyes or do you, how does that work? Do you know how that works? Like, I don't know how it works. How does I, it fit in the, what is I, the story I'm for that one? I'm thinking that when the light comes upon him. Yeah. It's actually similar to the story in the in the book of Moses where the Lord's glory comes on Moses and it transfigures him so he can endure the presence of God. Yeah. So I think that's what's happening at the first vision is this light is like transfiguring Joseph and preparing him for God's presence. Hmm. And then so I think that the touching of the eyes probably happens right after that like like there's the light that's transfiguring him, and then his eyes are touched, and then he's able to. Then he can see the see two the personages. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Well, right. it does seem that everybody scripturally that ever talked about entering the presence of God had to experience a deep transformation. In fact, there's nobody that really um, ever talks about seeing God without having gone through that. Right. There's Moses mm -hmm. in the burning bush. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and it literally says like remove thy feet like like it's it's a ceremonious thing and they all talk about this deep transformation okay so you have moses with the burning bush you have the transfiguration um on the top of the uh the, the mount with um peter james mount john Mariah. and yeah right, exactly right. sorry and then in the first vision you know he talks about uh, uh, almost the exact same thing Herman? um Herman? and even oh, yeah. even the brother of jared that saw the um right. the the hand of of the lord had to kind of get to the top of his mountain to- mountaintop and go through his purification process and so on and so forth um this it seems just par for the course so i'm digging it i'm digging it um i won't believe it until i read it in the book of zebulok <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, then I'll know it's then I'll know it's true, right? So anyway, keep right. going. No, so, I, I think ahead, it's dude. cool though that what you're doing is um, taking some of these sources from things people said outside of the scripture itself, but then seeing the way that it agrees with the scripture that we do have, yeah, right. and identifying those patterns in a way that I think helps us understand God and how He works a little bit better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, and when it yeah. agrees, then you can take what it does say and you can piece together a little bit more of the narrative of the 116 pages right. that we didn't have before. Like Mosiah the first, we don't really have much on him. Okay, and so how did this debunk, because I remember the original question was like, was there <laughs> any kind of um, research that you did that like myth busted some of these kind of like anti-Mormon arguments or, you know, kind of debunked some of the cynical criticisms of our faith and so on and so forth. And so you say the interpreters did this for you. Right. So So how so? Along with the first vision. Okay, and along with the first vision. What I was seeing in the first vision was that I started piecing together other things from the accounts that we have, right, about how there was a kind of heavenly ascent aspect of the first vision where Joseph Smith, Mm -hmm. like, like he sees the Lord in the grove, right? Like the person who's in the grove and then he's lifted up to heaven, right? And he sees, like Lehi. So very first narrative of the Book of Mormon, right? Lehi, um, God's presence comes down to his level uh, on the stone, right? Pillar of fire rests on a stone. And then Lehi is taken up into heaven where he thought he saw God sitting on his throne. So first the divine presence comes down then the human being is lifted up to God's level. So God comes down to our level to lift us up to God's level. Well, that's, we call that the gospel. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jesus Christ. Condescension of God is right. Nephi says. Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The title page of the Book of Mormon says, you know, the book is to show us that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, right? God comes down in Christ to our level to lift us up to God's level, right? And so, there are accounts of the first vision where Joseph makes clear that the vision doesn't just happen in the way that we think where divine beings come down to the grove and kind of that's it. Joseph says things like, um, my mind was taken away from the objects which surrounded me. Mm-hmm. So he's not he's not experiencing the grove anymore. He's like experiencing someplace else, mm-hmm. right? And then he says, um, which ironically is the exact reverse of the tunnel vision uh, experiment that you talked about earlier, how when people are stressed or angry, they get, mm. you know, hyper focused, whereas mm. their vision is amplified when they're less stressed. I imagine being pure enough to enter the presence of God is the ultimate amplification of of oh. of everything, right? Which echoes the way that Enoch did I just talks make, about. Yeah. Uh, Wait, did I just make Don Bradley go? Oh, yes, like, you did. did. <laughs> I just made Don Bradley go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, Chris! I'm writing this in my journal tonight. <laughs> d- it, d- and, I can die and, happy. And, and Carden, that's like what it talks about with Enoch and the way that his vision was expanded. And his uh, Moses as well. Wide as eternity. Yeah, the brother of Jared. Yeah, same thing. The revelation yeah. he has on the mountaintop is a vision of everything from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's this there's this widening of perception. Yeah, so what's correct. happening is he's actually being able to see the way that God sees. He's able to like have a sort of comprehensive view. So we talk about God as all seeing, mm-hmm. right, all knowing. So the follow up to this. So there, by the way, there's also a um, hold on, hold on, hold on. All seeing, all seeing eye. If you put these up to your eye, you Uh-oh. have a triangle. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. an eye inside of a triangle. 
Oh. <laughs> totally. So, so especially if you picture the equilateral triangle, right? Mm-hmm. Like oh. on the dollar bills? Yeah. yeah. On like the that. dollar bills? Like that. So and we've gone from temple. being the faith of perfect symbolism to the cultural imperialistic manifestation of all evil. And now we need to build an obelisk. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I, just, like, you know, I, just, There's a leap. I was just trying to throw all the conspiracy <laughs> architectural theories into one. That's in the you book of Zebulok, right? Yeah. yeah, that's in the book of Zebulok. <laughs> so so right? I'll come back to this all seeing eye. Okay. Yeah. Um, Actually, one more question yeah. before we continue. So um, you had mentioned that this is kind of a, an archetype of going into the presence of the Lord, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in the Book of Mormon, it talks about how Jesus Christ is what is, is the person who can lead us into the presence of the Lord. And in one of the um, in one of the accounts mm-hmm. of the first vision, it talks about how Joseph just simply says, "I saw the Lord." Yeah. And when he sees the Lord. Maybe this is this is Sean Bailey doctrine. I have no idea if this is true. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. What if he sees the Lord first? He sees Jesus Christ first. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus Christ, when he touches Joseph's eyes, then he can see the father. Mm -hmm. And then he receives the witness from the father that this is his beloved son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's the same kind of pattern that we have in the temple. Right. Yeah. We have. The veil represents Jesus Christ, and we have to pass through the veil in order to to see the Father and return to his presence. Right, 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 right. So on this, yeah. So on this, a friend and hey, I... Hey, you got a yeah. Um, That's not as good as an oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a yeah, yeah right? Yeah. You know? Okay, cool. <laughs> so my friend Walker Wright and I did an article recently in BYU Studies on the First Vision where oh, awesome. we show... That if you look, so so critics will talk about, or skeptics or whatever, will talk about. I the, just call them losers. The, <laughs> the 1832 <laughs> account of the first vision. Um, they'll they'll note that it only mentions the Lord. Yeah, to him, yeah, 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 right? yeah. And so then, because like in 1835, he's talking about two personages. They'll say, well, the you know the story evolves later in 1835. He's starting to add an additional personage there, but the father was not originally part of. The first vision experience they're saying yeah right yeah that's what they're so saying. what we showed is that if you look at the changes joseph smith is making to the bible in 1832 and 33 that he's changing it in ways that say people can see the father mm-hmm. which appears to be echoing his own experience so he changes the famous verse at the beginning of psalm 14 that says uh where it says is the fool that has said in his heart there is no god yeah he changes it to it is the fool that has said in his heart, no man can see God. Ah. Oh. Okay. And so, um, or maybe it's no man hath seen God. He says one or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, then he changes the rest of that psalm to make it sound like the first vision. Like it says like things like, um, they draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, mm-hmm. and so on. And so uh, my friend and others had noticed that it's like Joseph Smith is creating like another uh, telling of the first vision, but in Psalm 14, right? Interesting. Oh, wow. Well, one of the interesting things about what he does there, where he makes it say, is the fool that has said in his heart, uh, no man has seen God or no man can see God, that that's actually what it says in the Gospel of John, right? It says, no man has seen God at any time. Uh, the Son, he hath declared him or something. Yeah, okay. And so... If you look at what Joseph Smith does with that verse in the JST, he changes it to say, um, no man has seen God at any time except he hath declared the Son, meaning no one has seen the, the only time that anyone has seen the Father is when the Father declares that the Son is his Son. You, oh, you mean like, oh, at the this baptism. is my beloved Son? Yeah. Hear him? Like that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Right? Where is, I'm going to look this up. Where is this? That's John 1. Yeah, you better not be making up crap on the fly, Don. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm, I'm so good at making up scripture that he's going to find it. He's going to look, and it's going to be there. You know what I'm saying? See how clever I am? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So um, anyway, so Joseph is changing it so that it actually seems like it reflects the first vision. But he's making this change in like 1832 or 33, back around the time that he wrote the 1832 account of the first vision. Mm-hmm. So if the skeptical theory is right, and Justice Smith is just making up the father being involved in the first vision years later, yeah, 
why does it seem to be already reflected in the JST in yeah. 1832 at the same time that Joseph is writing that account? Wait, okay. Don, okay. are you saying that the critics are not necessarily taking all of the sources into account that they should be <laughs> and might be painting a smaller, more cynical picture than they should if they want to know the full truth? It's the oh, myopic, it's my myopic <laughs> vision. It's that tunnel vision. Um, so in John chapter 1, verse 18, it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And then um, the Joseph Smith translation changes that. No man hath seen God at any time, except he hath borne record of the Son. Like, ex- this is my beloved Son. Like, this is my beloved Son. For except it is through him, no man can be saved. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you can't enter the presence of God. You cannot be saved in the presence of God unless it's through Jesus Christ. Well, now, what do you say to all the people that are like, well, why are you messing with the original Greek as written by the original apostles? Hmm? You know, if, well, Joseph Smith went in and altered oh, the language, oh, right? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, like, totally. can't what they thought that verse meant be taken into a I pretty mean, solid account? You I'll, know? I'll, I'll trust a prophet over a scribe. Well, the thing okay. is, okay. the thing is, Latter Day Saints have never gotten rid of the standard King James Bible. They use JST alongside that, and yeah. so it's not a question of whether one of these is totally right and one wrong. Yeah. It's like these are additional insights Joseph Smith is adding from his own experience as a prophet. And something that I find often in the JST is that it's more of an expansion on the idea within there right rather than something that's like a refutation of what's being said right, like right, less right. a correction more of an uh, expansion a, expansion of the of the doctrine yeah okay, okay. So, so more, more sounds of, like a cope more of what i found <laughs> that, that's right I guess <laughs> more of what i found that like exploded my head okay yeah sure. uh and you have to realize these all hit me essentially almost like at the same moment. And like, this was like, while you were out of the church. This was while I was out of the church working on this paper up at Utah State. And, and you're yeah. starting to piece and all of these together they and seeing all, these parallels, All the right? dots like connected all at once, basically. Okay, so I was, I was working on this, I was pondering this, and I suddenly saw how the brother of Jared story was a temple veil story. And right? the beginning of an exodus. Then, then I saw how the... Um, story about the finding of the interpreters in the Justice Smith Senior interview was the same thing. And, and the then I was seeing that th- you had the same thing in the first vision. Justice Smith's eyes were touched so that he might see spiritual things, right? And he's being given like divine vision. Well, then I saw that. So, so we actually have an account of Justice Smith finding his first seer stone which I argue came shortly after the first vision. So this is one of the incidents that critics actually find most embarrassing for Joseph Smith, right, that they say is like, you know, shows um, he was a fraud or whatever. The 1826 hearing for glass looking. Yeah. Right. Where he's um, he's being accused of being a glass looker. Uh, and he doesn't deny it. The guy needed an attorney. Okay, a lot of us, a lot <laughs> of us could be accused of being lookers. He's like, just saying. <laughs> he's like twenty years old. <laughs> Red card. <laughs> Dad joke. <laughs> Seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. He's okay, like okay, I'll take Twenty that. years old. He's being accused of using a seer stone, event essentially. Yeah. And his response to the accusation is, "Yes, and let me tell you how I found it." Uh huh. <laughs> like, so he just like admits everything. Yeah. Right. And so the story that he tells, according to, so, so there was a local physician who had been asked, W.D. Purple, he'd been asked by the magistrate to take notes on the trial. And so he's the guy who later. Dr. Purple? Of the trial. Dr. Purple. That is like a cool that sounds Palmyra like a, resident. A band <laughs> name from the 60s. It's, uh, it's uh, a character saying? from Clue, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right? almost, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Purple? Yeah. Professor Plum. Right. Almost. So, oh, yeah. So it, was, yeah. It, was, it was Dr. Purple in the courtroom with the pen or whatever. Yeah. With the feather duster. He's asked to take notes. And so he later gives an account of what happened at the trial. So he gives what Joseph Smith said. He says that Joseph said that once he really felt prompted to go look in the seer stone of this neighbor girl Sally where the Chase. Smiths lived uh, around Palmyra. What was right? her name? And her name was, is Sally Chase. We know about her from other sources. She, okay. They were neighbors to the Smiths, the Chase family. That's cool. So Sally has this green stone, the seer stone that she uses. Joseph feels prompted to go to her house, look in the stone. He does. She lets him borrow the stone. He puts it in his hat. He looks in it, and he says he can see a light 
that glows brighter and brighter till it's as bright as the noonday sun, mm. which mm. I swear I've heard somewhere, you know, uh-huh. like, right? brighter than the noonday sun, right? And um, he, uh, it's a stone. And it's the stone he sees is 150 miles away um, near the New York western uh, border of the state of New York. And it's near, it's off of the stream that empties into Lake Erie uh, under the roots of a tree. So a couple years later, Joseph's parents finally let him go out because he's a teenager, right? Like, uh, let him go out and recover the stone. And so he doesn't say how he finds the stone, but um, we know that he, like Oliver Cowdery later, he uses a rod for a while. He's a rodsman. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming he actually uses the rod like, like, King Mosiah being led to the interpreters by the Lehona. Oh, I'm right. assuming he's led to the seer stone by the rod. Hey, in any case, well, and the other stone too. So you have the other stone and no, some this, sort this of would be before he has his other stone. No, you this, said that he saw the stone in the in Sally oh, Chase's stone. Right. So he so right. he looked into this right. one interpreter. So he wouldn't be taking her stone with him on the journey. But yes, he would have he would have known the approximate area of this stone. He so actually, the Liahona was kind of like two parts, right? It had a part where you could see writing, uh-huh. and then it had a pointer. And right. so you're saying he had like the the rock that he could see things, and then he also probably used some sort of pointer, which was like a rod or something. Right. Okay. Right, right, right. So he goes, he digs under the roots of this tree, he digs all night, and he finds the stone. This is his white stone, right? Oh. So think like Brother Jared's story too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he finds this white stone, and um, he washes it off in the stream, and he puts it in his hat, and he looks in, and uh, time and space are obliterated. He can see anything. And he says he had acquired one of the attributes of deity, an all-seeing eye. Mm-hmm. Whoa. 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 Okay. So not only, think about this. <laughs> The, one of the common claims about Joseph Smith is he just makes stuff up and he makes it up. Um, he sort of starts out doing one thing, but then later he just decides to make up a bunch of other stuff. Right? Yeah. So like whenever the, it's convenient. Right. To him. So the idea is there's no long range vision. There's no consistency. He doesn't have like some solid, consistent spiritual vision. He's just a con man who shifts with every wind of personal advantage but then all of a sudden he becomes the most pernicious and precise and focused con man when they need him to be because they can't pick a lane yeah he's an uh, evil you genius know, but, but yeah he's also, also a like, blithering idiot exactly. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. all the above mm. but um so uh an opportunist right so i had thought like i said when i thought that just smith was an opportunist i had thought that once he becomes a Freemason in 1842, that's when he has the idea of this endowment structure that he then gives, right, administers to other people. Is yeah. the all-seeing eye part of Freemasonry? It is. That's mm-hmm. what that's what that is, oh, right? Totally, okay. mm-hmm. totally. So um, he later in Nauvoo, he's not just coming up with this stuff out of nowhere, or just because he's encountered Freemasonry in 42. These elements have been in the Book of Mormon in 1829, Brother Jared's story, yeah, yeah. the Book of Mormon in 1828, the story of the Nephites finding the interpreters, wow. the first vision right at the beginning of the 1820s. Yeah. And so we're talking like And you're saying the 116 over pages years. maybe too, right? Huh? And also maybe in the 116 Well, that's what pages. I was saying with 1828. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, over 20 years before he becomes a Freemason and institutes the endowment, Joseph already has the structure of much of what happens in the endowment. It's there in these accounts, yeah. right? So one thing that, like, uh, something that just did not seem believable to me suddenly was that Joseph Smith had come up with this ritual structure yeah. that's reflected in the first vision and then these other things later. Uh, when he was 15 or 14, right, um, I didn't. I just couldn't believe that he came up with this complex ritual structure and then doesn't use it until he's, you know, thirty six or whatever in Nauvoo, yeah. right? Like, that's that's not how teenagers think. When you're fourteen, you're not like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with this complex ritual and all this. But and then, like, he starts a church, 
But then he doesn't, he sits on the ritual for another dozen years? I yeah. Mean, why? No. I, yeah, I when you're I, almost I, I, 40, I don't you don't look back don't and you're it. like, you know, I should pull out from mothballs that thing I came up with when I was 14. So this is a really solid refutation of the idea that Joseph Smith just lifted the temple ritual from Freemasonry. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then... And is that the biggest myth that you feel was debunked by well, your research? Well, hold on, yeah. So go, okay. well, going along with that, okay. So it's not just that he had the structure of this ritual. It's, remember, his eyes are touched. He acquires this stone. He acquires one of the attributes of deity, mm -hmm. an all-seeing eye. This is the idea of theosis, human deification, right? That yeah. human beings, like, like can become just like, like what I was saying earlier, yeah, God comes down to our level, human level, to lift us up to God's level, right? That's what's going on in the first vision. That's what's going on with Joseph getting this gift of seeing, uh, getting this seer stone. And so not only is Navu ritual there from the beginning, mm -hmm. Navu doctrine yeah. is there literally from day one of the restoration of the sacred grove. So the wow. idea that he's just totally developing, creating everything on the fly later, opportunistically, that doesn't fit with the evidence that we find. So this this was like, in, in a lot of ways, this was just like totally head exploding yeah. for me. Okay, hold on. I just had a thought. So in um, the record of the brother of Jared, it says that you, because you have seen these things, you are redeemed from the fall. Yeah. You said in one of the accounts, it has Joseph Smith being lifted up mm. almost after he fell because of the influence of Satan, right? Mm -hmm. He yeah. falls down on the ground, mm -hmm. he's overcome mm -hmm. by the destroyer, and then he's lifted up mm -hmm. from his fall, so, like almost symbolically, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that he can see, and so that he can come unto God and be like God, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. That's cool, totally. Dude. That's That's cool, some cool symbolism. And straight up from the beginning, like we're talking as early an experience as he's ever had, right? Right, Yeah. right. right. All right, dude. Wow, this is nuts, man. I, I could talk with you for hours, but unfortunately, we got another guest coming in here, and we're gonna have to bounce. Sure. Um, but yeah, we're gonna have to have you back as soon as oh, possible. Totally. You know what I'm saying? Because totally. I yeah. am absolutely loving this. Any last thoughts? You oh. you look like you're chomping to say something, Brad. I know oh. that. Like, it, it, it. <laughs> this is the most vapid <laughs> thing <laughs> I'm <laughs> ever going to add to a discussion. <laughs> okay, what, 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 what? <laughs> when you said that Joseph Smith felt like all time and space was obliterated. My immediate thought was, oh, doom scrolling. <laughs> all time and space <laughs> is obliterated. <laughs> and he doesn't look up to it. And <laughs> was that a spiritual indictment of Instagram? You Which know, also, so actually, I mean. <laughs> or TikTok. Well, think about it this way. Like, scroll. what would you do if you could have, like, access to any knowledge at your fingertip? Wait, I think you know what you TikTok. would do. You get that you get that Dude. test every day, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So wow. maybe it's an opportunity for us to think, hey, how how should I be using this? Dude. If we use yeah. social media properly, we can become like God. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Awesome. Well, it definitely yes. takes self-control of deity. It sure does. So anyway, um, all right. Let us know where you go wrong, guys. This has been awesome. It's been real and it's been fun. Make sure you check us out. Uh, if you haven't like this video yet, please like. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. If you would like to contribute to the show, you can contribute through Venmo, or you can check us out on our website, warbradio.com. Right.